power was probably more uh, of shortages because of COVID. Yeah. The washer and dryer, shortages because China is trying to shut down, but also fails. So the only place there is any relative success would be Western land. You could shower in the washer and dryer. I mean, not the you shower in the water. Jump in. Like Might get a little dizzy. So with that, here we've talked about this before, but all the states had competing claims. But all the states had debt. Colonies issued bonds, states issued bonds, and they were selling their land to pay the bond. So like Virginia wanted this to sell the land to farmers and speculators so they could pay back their bonds. In fact, Virginia actually sold a lot of land and paid back most of their bonds. Since like Massachusetts saw lots of bonds to pay off. And so everybody wanted this land. And there were people who were moving, oh, did we put it? Speculators were getting sweetheart deals from the states to buy this land to sell it at a, at a premium, hoping that the price will go up down the road. Of course, we have a depression, but that's another story. And what do you call somebody who just was moving in? And yes, taking the land not only from the people who live there, but without any legal claim from the states or the national government. Yes, squatters. And they were just coming like Daniel Boone. Daniel Boone would live to be 86 years old. He would not, probably not then. <laughs> uh, 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 who? Yeah, good point. Valid. He has clean vitamin C. Vitamin C. I eat four to five pounds of vitamin C a day. And the real thought was, what about the union? The union of these states are already kind of breaking apart. And the real fear was the West would break away. This would be a constant fear all the way up until we'll pass the War of 1812. I mean, the really big thing would be railroads. There's always this fear. That's why New Orleans was so important. So the, the Confederation Congress had to deal with something. Remember, they needed nine votes. First off, this is technically government or land owned by the federal government. Yes, once again, they're stealing it from the people who live there. To their point of view, they're not using it right. And so the Confederation Congress would pass the land ordinance of 1785. And when the new constitution would be written, this, they kept this law. So they're gonna survey all the land. They're gonna put teams of surveyors out. And what they're gonna do is, they're gonna divide this up into range and latitude lines and come up with six by six mile sections, so 36 square miles, and then each of these or did I say section? I'm sorry. Six by six townships that would be divided up into 36 one by one mile sections. And that is why, if you ever look at a land ownership map of any place that was had federal government land, it looks like a checkerboard pattern. The state of Montana, it's all checkerboard because it's all these sections and townships divided up. But that's why, let me say this real quick not here. These places already had their land ownership decided when the U.S. was formed. And the same with Texas. Texas came in as an independent country that was annexed by the United States. Same deal. Same thing with part of California. California was independent for a very short time. Yes. Actually, it wasn't even public education for all yet, but that was the beginning of the crisis. So valid point. Actually, women was dependent on the state. Dependent on the state. Northern states, women were allowed into public education. The South, the South had always trailed the public education. And arguably, I just still do. And not because people think I'm smart. Of course they're smart. It's just a different priorities. But the revenue would go with that, and that would begin to set the stage for this idea of public education for everybody. Now, that would not become the norm to the next century, especially when 
you know, business leaders wanted an educated combined workforce and things like that. And they're setting up the beginnings of public education. And there's always been a tax on public education. There are a lot right now, but that's another story for down the road. So, for example, boards of surveyors went into Ohio and they begin to survey Ohio. Ohio's one of the first ones, and there's all the townships and then the sections. A very common sale would be a quarter section or 160 acres, a very common size. We will come back to that when we get to something called homesteads. And that is why if you go to some of these states, especially if they're really flat, so they, they can really have the nice square townships and sections. The states are really square. If you go to Iowa, I mean, the state is just really square. All the roads run either north, south, or east, west. Every county is like a square. They're all on these lines. Something about Iowa. Iowa's a square state. I blame corn. Who's with me? Has anyone been to Iowa? Yeah, it's nothing but corn and turkey farms. Okay, with that, so we're going to backtrack. What about what's going to become of this land? Okay, now we're going to survey it. Now what? Well, Thomas Jefferson would propose the Land Ordinance of 1784. He was not a member of Congress, so he did it through his friends in Virginia. He was actually, actually the U.S. ambassador to Paris. And he thought we could divide these up into 14 states. Here are the states. He, had a, he, just, he basically just had a map and just drew lines. It didn't really make much sense because state borders kind of fits on geographic features like rivers, but he just, that will make states. But what kind of states? Jefferson was desperately scared of the future. He did not think the United States could survive in its current way. He knew it. He knew it. And this should tell you why. Of these new 14 states, no slave codes. Slavery cannot function in areas that don't have slave codes. And the important thing about that is, if you ever heard the term free states and slave states, we'll get to the civil war and say free and slave. But free means no slave codes. So things like, not you know, obviously the most important is the plantation laws. But you know, those ones that buy these slaves, certain abilities like to uh, meet, to assemble, to have weapons, education. Those, those laws are necessary. For slavery. If you don't have them, slavery can't function. The most important slave code, strong militia. And so, no. So Jefferson, what is ironic about this? Because Jefferson is a what? Slave Massive slaveholder. Who also has unbelievably large amounts of debt and is collateral of the slaves. He's intimately tied to him in every way possible. But he also has a nice home. He has lots of wine. That's the biggest library in the Americas. Jefferson wants to keep his life, but he also knows that slavery equals tyranny. And if you want a republic where you have the citizens, to Jefferson's point of view, white men, speaking their representatives, that's his vision, slavery is incompatible. Because, okay, we mentioned the slave codes, and all of you think, okay, slavery is gonna repress the slaves. Well, slavery also represses free people too. Because the system of slavery can't allow free people to say whatever they want to do or whatever they want, because it might trigger factor. If, they, if you have people out there who are free saying slavery is wrong, that might trigger a what? Slave rebellion. And so every place where there's slavery, they repress the, the speech, the communication, the rights of people who are free to, by definition. They're not going to allow somebody to run for office in the, in the South who's going to say slavery is wrong. Because that might trigger a slave rebellion. And so he looks at these two incompatible majority slaves, fewer and fewer slaves up here, it won't survive. It will blow the thing up. And that gets back to my oft-repeated statement, they had no idea slavery was wrong. I'm kidding. No, they all knew slavery was wrong. And I'm saying that because there is a, a, there's a lot of people to this day who say, oh, they had no idea. Slavery was old. They didn't know slavery was wrong. No, they knew. They really knew. The governor of Florida has just said that no one knew slavery was wrong. He literally just said that. He's the governor. Huh? 
Well, he has a certain political point of view of what he says. I don't know if he believes it, but it's the point is, no, they do. Trust me, they knew. I hope all of you kind of understand the slavery is wrong. You understand? You're not sure? It's out there. Let's see both sides. All right. I'm biased against slavery. I'm really taking a stand, aren't I? So with that, it got eight votes. It got eight votes. This is one of the great what ifs in history. Anybody want to guess the states that voted against it? Yeah, southern states. What are the great what ifs in history? But it also tells you the all the contradictions of Thomas Jefferson. He knew slavery was wrong, but he wasn't going to get rid of his slaves. It's going to be, you will see these contradictions in people all the time. Now, he's a slaver. At the same time, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Isn't life interesting? So with that, a compromise, the Northwest Ordinance. This is also sometimes called the Land Act or the Land Ordinance of 1787. But everyone calls it the Northwest Ordinance. This is a big one. So we took the ordinance, the Land Ordinance of 1785. So we've got, we're surveying the land, and this will create the system to become a state. When an area gets 5,000 people, it, it will be designated a territory. And that means even though it will still be governed by the federal government, it will have a local legislature and some local rules. And so territories of the United States to this day, that is their, their limit there. Like for example, Washington DC is a territory of the United States. Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States. The people who live there are American citizens. Yet the federal government has power to control their laws. Now, the federal government has given Puerto Rico and um, D.C. kind of home rule. They govern themselves. But they're still territories. They're still American citizens, but they don't have the rights of the state. Like in Puerto Rico, they don't vote for president. They don't have members of the Senate. And they are American citizens. In fact, Puerto Rico is bigger than 20 states. Good question. I just assume that they got government and bank for me. I just wanted to get them the friends, but it, but it's still in the process of beginning because they are previous ones. That's actually a very good guess, but no, people don't want them to become a state for who they'll vote for. That's number fifty. Huh? Yeah, they don't want to make they don't want to get all new flags. <laughs> yeah, and DC's bigger than um three states. So that 60,000 to become a state. That's really small. Then it wasn't then it was only small. Today it's really small. And so that is going to allow for some really weird states that have virtually nobody living there, yet they're states. And this was done purely politically. You might have heard of these states, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming. Can anybody explain to me why there are two Dakotas? I know what you're thinking, why is there even one Dakota? Good point, but why are there two? Republicans in 1889 were really worried that Democrats might gain control of the Senate. They just assumed those states would be Republican, so Republican senators. That's what that was in 1889. It didn't actually turn out that way for a lot of years. Now it's basically that way. Are we still able to like divide Texas? Yeah, Texas can be divided by states. And so can California. California will be divided in any number of states they want. Yeah, California's bigger than gross domestic product of all but about 10 countries. So that. And then five states north of the Ohio, Ohio, they will have no slave codes, AKA free. But I, you notice I put down that it just creates a sectional divide. Because if these states have slave codes, it applies states below the Ohio. I'm sorry, if these states don't have slave codes, it applies these states what? Do, and there's the sectional divide. And, by, and literally by 1820, Free states, slave states. I don't know what would have happened if Jefferson's plan would have passed, 
but it really is an amazing what if. It's, it's hard to even imagine. One more thing. I cut this map up, or took this map, but you can see some of the states, Jefferson state names he proposed. Michigania, Sylvania, uh, Gerosocius, Metropotamia. I really like Polypotamia. I would have loved to have been for Polypotamia. <laughs> And then Washington. Yeah, we'll see. Okay, so sectional divide, and these are going to come in. It didn't ban slavery per se, but without slave codes, it can't function. Later on, these states, some would ban slavery, some would. So going to Ohio, almost immediately, settlement just exploded. Yes, that means one of the first major wars in American history. And the creation of the United States Army will come out of that in a place called Ohio. And I love this wagon, or the Ohio. That settlers came in to take the land from the people who lived there. And the people who lived there are going to fight. And this is nearing the last chance that the original Americans have to keep their land. It's coming to that. Big battles, fallen timber to tippy canoe. So, Let's talk money supply. I know you're thinking, wait a second, why are we getting to hard nosed economics? Money supply. Here are some terms we all know just to review inflation, value of money goes down, price goes up, deflation. I know you know this, but I want to make sure we got this clear. And markets. The market needs government to control the money supply, they have to. And there's no one to do it in the Confederation. If the market can't control the money supply, the market can't function. If anybody says the market would function better, you know, the government comes in and destroys the market. Well, you know, it can. But without the government, there'd be no market and we would be Somalia, which has no government and is run by warlords. Yeah. Anarchy would be really unpleasant. That's different than anarchism. Mm -hmm. Anarchism is socialism. Kind of the extreme, so we'll get to that. And anarchy is, is if anybody says anarchy, avoid them. Mm -hmm. Be afraid to them. Did I say to them? Of them. So, in today, the Federal Reserve, there are other measures, other ways, but the Federal Reserve has the main function of controlling the mice. And they do it with interest rates. If there's too much inflation, they raise interest rates. And that cuts down money in circulation, makes it hard to buy and sell. And opposite when there's deflation. What is the, what is the Federal Reserve doing right now? Yeah, they are raising interest rates. And their stated goal is to, to get more people to force unemployment. They actually want to create a recession, which they are achieving. It. There's going to be an economic recession because that will lower prices. So it's a very hand-handed way. And especially people at the lower end of the wage scale, like the bottom 80%, they, they will be the ones hit. But that, that is the stated goal of Jerome Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve. He said, we got to get, we have to have more unemployment. Do they want to raise unemployment by 1% of the cost? Yeah. So the idea is to cut off the bottom 1% of societies. No, not one, but not 80. Sorry, 180% of societies and the rest of the function. Yeah. Well, not rest of the function. Um, so they lower inflation. And we'll talk about it. So they want more, they want something closer to deflation, not inflation. We'll come back to that. So I've just kind of set up the, the initial terms. We'll say we'll get to closer why. Because this is one of those things you might say, oh, this, why are we doing economics? Think about how many decisions in our past will be decided by what people think the value of the money is. Everything. And that means the people who decide that have immense power over our lives. And I should add, I'm giving you the very basic, easy version. It is so complex. If you knew how the stock market and the bond market function, it would blow your head up. In special semester after the 2008 crash, and I will explain to my class, you're ready for this, the uh, how credit default swaps work, and they were literally a combination of blow your 
unbelievable. Let me tell you, paper market. So what happened is there's a depression after the war. The pre, there's a pre-capitalism, but there are markets, people buying and selling goods. And we all know the basics of the market. If people want something, speaking of credit default swaps, <laughs> we will learn about those in special topic sessions. And then I'll tell you how to, how to get money from fresh coal and all the companies. Okay, if you know how market function, you know, uh, merchants are trying to sell goods and they have to try to find a price that people can still buy their goods and they can make enough money to survive. And vice versa, if you're if you're if you're a consumer wanting to buy goods, you want to something you need and what price you can afford. And that market would be kind to find some equilibrium. It's not the same as today because it's free capitalism. This is not a world we would understand. It would make very little sense to us. I know what you're saying. It's your world. Well, yeah, but. And therefore, there's currency, but there's all kinds of paper money. I mean, everyone has paper money. There's New York currency. Oh, by the way, this is from Shade Rebellion. I don't know why I put this here. I just thought it was kind of amusing. They're fighting. This is <laughs> a retailer's prison. Ah! But there's every state has currency. New York's issuing paper money. They're still using pounds. There, there, there's colonial currency called an uh, early U.S. government currency called continental. So you get the point. Every time you go to the merchant, you have to kind of like bid. Well, I'll take, you know, two Rhode Island dollars and one um, Mexican taller and one pound to pay for this. There wasn't a set price. It just would be what you have and think how slow it would be. And then specie. The actual gold or silver coins, it's going to skyrocket in value because people say they want that because they, the value is in the coin. And so people are going to hoard those. And so you're going to have all kinds of different prices. Nobody's going to know what anything is worth today at all. And there's no banks. Therefore, it's really hard to get credit. And so I was just reading this book, a great book about the 1894. Classic history. Really good. About the 1894 right here. But they're talking about all these speculators trying to buy up, buy land, and they have to borrow from the Bank of Amsterdam. And they would send a letter and wait six months to get it. And then they get a piece of paper saying the Bank of Amsterdam will pay it. Have the precursor to the check. And then they would, it just, it was chaos. Yeah. I just wanted to comment. That I think it's interesting during a time when people were questioning the value of paper currency because of the government's racket, nobody questioned the extent they wanted money that was a shiny metal coin just because it was a shiny metal. Not quite shiny metal, we're on the right track, yeah. Because people assumed that gold had value, it was accepted. Yeah, I just think it's interesting that even during this time when we questioned social currency, nobody ever questioned the value of gold. That's actually a really good point. Because the only thing that makes gold valuable is that the countries would accept it for taxes. Yeah, that's so. What's the difference? That's a really good point. It's amazing how we just we get accept we just accept things and just kind of go along with. It. Now, one thing I should add: there were merchants who would be creditors, but and if you have this situation, how can you plan for the future if you don't know today? what your money is worth. You really don't know what it's gonna be worth tomorrow. No idea. And the big problem with that is, if you don't know what tomorrow is gonna be, probably gonna be cautious is not strong enough of a word. I better put my gold coins in a jar and bear it in the backyard. Because I have no idea what the future will be. Well, if everybody bought, does that, who's buying the goods? No, it's in jars in the backyard. So deflation, you might have prices going down, but no one's buying anything. And what this meant is everything's a risk. And the more risk, the greater the fear. So you can see that with bad economic times, when people are fearful of the future because things look bad right now, they don't invest. 
and that leads to fear. And everything's about risk. What kind of risk would that investment be? If I spend what little money I have today, what's tomorrow going to be? I mean, that is happening at this moment. You want to see this whole thing about money supply and fear and what this can do to a nation. Look at Great Britain at this moment. It literally in real time. Yesterday, their entire financial system about French. And that, this is really bad. This could ripple to everyone, literally, yesterday. And they found some way for the Bank of, of, of England, it's called, their, their Federal Reserve, to buy back their government debt called gilts. And they bought them back and it just barely saved that. And that would have, it would have rippled everywhere. Britain is in free fall. They're gonna do massive tax cuts for very rich people. And people are realizing this might destroy everything. And, huh? No, it's not the queen dying. No, no actually nothing to do with the queen dying, but, but it could be, huh? New prime minister uh, believes in what we call conservative or supply side economics. And Britain already has high inflation, and they're fearful the tax cuts will lead to more inflation. And then the queen died. And so with that, and so what it means is there's no investment. Who's going to invest in the future? And think about those people who are speculating in land. If you borrowed money to speculate in the land and no one's investing in land, you're stuck with things you can't pay for. George Washington is an example of somebody who was freaking out by 1786. Sure, he gave Apollo at home. He had a lot of land, but he was speculating in, in the Ohio country. He was obsessed with Ohio. Remember, remember, this goes back to Fort Necessity. So with that, so let's get to the money supply. Last thing for today. New call. Now I know you know okay, my brief little explanation of money, why money supply is so important. Really quick, let me do this. So Massachusetts, I love this. This Massachusetts currency from that time, and they put a hole in it so people can't use it anymore. Technically, if it's legal tender, it can still be used unless it's damaged in some way. That's why if you go to the Federal Reserve Bank here in Helena, that's one of the things they give you if you tour the Federal Reserve Bank. They give you a bag of shredded money because they shred all the money so they can't use the old currency. I have a bag. Whenever students go, hey, you want a bag of currency? I have a bag. Okay, so they limited currency. Land tax had to be paid in specie, and so that means most people have no specie, so they can't pay it back. And there's deflation. This is done by the state government. Rhode Island, printed currency. They put a tax on wealth. Land and wealth. We have basically no wealth tax in the US today. And they encourage inflation. Two states. Now, last question. I want you to think about this. Two states, right? It's all we know. You have a little bit of background. Which state? favorite creditors. Creditors are the people who loan the money. So what are debtors? They're what? Well, yeah, yeah, and the payback. The meaning the merchant class. Not them. Which one favored them? Here or here? Wow. It's Massachusetts. Tomorrow, we'll play Dick Capito. I'll hand back the text. Okay. Sounds good. So, will we do a presentation and special topics? Just come to the door the hallway again. I have to get a desk.
We get the death through. All right. Where are you going to be tomorrow? Oh, okay. So I'm going to hand back the test. I, I'm going to sign eight more pages to the reading. Thank you on Monday, okay? Bad mouthing my apologies. I threw someone out this evening. I threw someone out this evening. Yes. Work. 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 Work.